Your YouTube feed is crap. Stop wasting your time watching bot-boosted shills and self-appointed gurus cloying for your attention. Instead, join the Goslings interview, live stream, and podcast. The Goslings, a dark lit digital speakeasy of free thinkers, a super chat of radical truth seeking wizards who eat trolls for second breakfast. Topics that'll make your mama's hair stand on end, ideas that'll make your pastor's knees knock, guests that will illuminate the hidden chambers of your mind, and interviews that strike down the darkness. Welcome to the Goslings. What's up? What's everyone? up, everyone? <laughs> Nick was running an experiment real quick yep. to see if he could hit the head one last time. So good to see you guys. It Thank you for out, watching. It was a massive it. failure. It was. Oh well. <laughs> Nope. You get to a certain age. <laughs> That's right. Anyways, welcome everyone. Hey. I'm Jonathan. I'm Nick. And we are the Goslings. Hello. And we are super excited to do this. This is the first of what it should be a quarterly yep. thing. Yep. Um, but uh, we're going to tell you about it in a second. First of all, we're going to get through just real quick some front of house stuff. Absolutely. And do all the things. Take up the broken sword of your finger. Strike down the subscribe button. We'd really appreciate it. Uh, we have something awesome lined up for you today, and we have every weekend book for like three months. You guys, you got to subscribe, hit the bell. Yeah. Really appreciate it. And yeah. uh, with that, we'll kick it over to you yeah. for sponsors. If you haven't noticed, my beard and my hair have looked luxurious lately. So luscious. That is thankful to, we owe all of that to Jardani Jovanovic Hair Care Product. Um, just a husband and wife team. They make these and they sell them out of Arizona. They have a website, jardanijovanovic.com. Real products for real men, or as I like to say, be as sexy as you are deadly. I like that. Give 007 a run for his money with jardanijovanovic.com. Trademark and, 2022. <laughs> right. And uh, Nick, uh, I noticed we're drinking out of some pretty dope mugs here i'm fear i'm feeling very we're not drinking dope out of mugs no we're not we're drinking out of dope mugs yeah, out of dope mugs. yeah it's very uh lakitamonian in mm, nature mm -hmm. very spartan-esque maybe yeah. you can speak briefly absolutely about... these are the kothan spartan mugs uh these are handcrafted each every one of them are handcrafted by uh joel cherico from cherico pottery yep. and uh these are a replica of what the spartans would travel in yeah, you travel with and use the drink out. Spartan Kothan mugs yeah. made in conjunction with our guest for today. Shall we? An amazing man, the Jedi Master of writing. Yeah, the guru of defeating resistance, mm -hmm. the man, the myth, the legend, our friend, Uncle Stephen Pressfield. Hello, Steve. <laughs> I'm laughing because I'm getting a reverb from you guys. It sounds like. Uh... Cousin Brucey from 1972 in New York City. Oh boy! Can, can you hear <laughs> yeah. me? Okay, a little bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Yeah, yeah. We can hear you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How are things since we last talked to you? How you been? Everything's good as long as I'm talking to you guys. Ah, <laughs> shucks. Shucks. No, shucks. Diana man. just had COVID for like the last ten days. Oh wow. Uh, oh man, I'm sorry. She finally tested negative this morning. Good. Good. Awesome. It's a long 10 days, I bet. Oh, man, it'll take it out of you. I hope she came through it okay. Yeah, everything's okay now. But Good. I am really hearing you guys double. It's just going to be a little tricky. Oh, okay. Uh-oh. Um, yeah, and I don't know. We've all we've had uh, some audio issues. That's kind of why we're running a little late. Um, yeah, I wonder if there's uh, some feedback, because I know that we had a little microphone issue, and uh, it's still a little choppy, but we'll see if we can yeah. uh, hopefully sort it out here maybe i should talk maybe i shouldn't yell into the microphone yeah is that I'll, what it I'll, is i'll do my best I'll move this over i'll do so. my best um in the meantime yes we should at least do our toast okay is that all absolutely, right absolutely yeah and uh <laughs> okay. uncle steve was good enough to uh join us for our toast last time and uh we'll do it again today absolutely. and uh i'll let you start yeah awesome okay. all right Take up the broken sword of your father and Take strike down the, the darkness. Sword of your father and strike <laughs> down the darkness. Cheers. That's right. Cheers, Uncle Steve. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we really wanted to do this uh, kind of every quarter. We had had the idea of doing fireside chats with Uncle Steve, mm-hmm. which is where we just talk about writing. We talk about things that you would want people to know that would help them. And we thought the first one right out of the gate that we should probably talk about are good habits that help you in your writing. Um, Steve, what are some good habits that you have had throughout the years that help you with your writing? Okay. <laughs> um, I'm certainly, I'm a, uh, a gym person and I always get, I get up at, I get up at like ridiculously early hours. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, yeah, sir. Okay. I get up at a ridiculously early hour and I uh, go to the gym six days a week, um, which is, uh, I believe, just the, the, the really, for me, the only way to start the day. I'm definitely a morning person. I don't write at night. I don't write in the afternoons. And uh, my reason for getting up early is to, and going to, to the gym, is to, is to, I'm keeping going, but I'm getting major reverb here. I'm hearing myself hey, really? as I talk. Okay. Um, is... Uh, Uh, I'll just keep going and pretend it's okay. Um, okay. It's it's all about resistance with a capital R. It's all about getting ready for the moment when you really sit down and have to kind of confront your own, you know, uh, your own resistance, your own self sabotage. So, the reason for me going to the gym is I want to sort of start the day doing something that's really hard, something that I don't want to do, and yeah. something that hurts. Um, so I'm sort of just trying to establish a series of, uh, little successes as my friend Randy Wallace says, he always likes to start the day with a little success and then another little success and another little success, take a walk, yeah. walk the dog, take a shower, have the breakfast, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so, um, that's my, you know, by the time I'm done at the gym, first of all, I'm exhausted, but I do feel like I've done Nothing I do for the rest of the day is going to be as hard as what I just did. <laughs> so I'm now ready to go. Yeah. And then okay. I'll come home, you know, have breakfast and then get after it. Yeah. 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 That's uh, the gym going for a run, doing any kind of exercise always seems to accomplish something huge at the beginning of the day and set the template and set the stage for what the rest of your day is going to look like. I like that you try to do the hardest thing first. Yeah. You know, you get those wins behind you. Yeah. Because for me, the hardest thing is definitely, you know, trying to get to a, like getting to a gym. That seems like that would be the most difficult thing. And <laughs> when you get, and you, you hit it so early too. I mean, when do you typically, when does your day start? When does Stephen Pressfield get out of bed and get after all that? I actually, I set the alarm for three o'clock. It sounds insanity, I know, but I'm, I'm up at six. I'm at the gym at five. I mean, I'm up at three. I was at the gym at five and I'm in bed by seven 30, usually at night, you know, wow. like it's kind of crazy. Friends invite you out to dinner. I basically can't go. We can't go. And Diana <laughs> goes to bed with me at the same time. I've driven her insane. You know, she now leads this crazy life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, you have to you have to sacrifice somewhere. You know, you can't burn the candle at both ends in perpetuity. So you have to kind of pick one or the other. Were you ever a night owl? Were you ever a late person? I, I wasn't. I was a night owl for years. Yeah. And um, you know, I was for years. And actually, I think those were some good years. I have nothing against that at all. But at the point <laughs> yeah. where I really decided that uh i'm in this writing game for real yeah. and i really did, sort of committed to a whole different way of of life yeah um you know for me i i st- i i had i didn't have success at all until i was in my 50s and so i've been ever since then i kind of feel like 
I'm so far behind the eight ball that I, I got to make up for a lot of little, a lot of lost years. Um, <laughs> so that's kind of why I, I get up early in the morning trying to catch up. I feel that same way at 39. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but you, um, uh, you wrote, uh, for a long time, years and years and years before your, before your book legend back advance was published. Yeah. Um, at what point during that journey writing that, you know, during that writing period, wh at what point was it like, what happened when you said, okay, I'm going, I'm going pro with this. Yeah. Uh, I think you and I, you guys and I, we've talked about this before a little bit, but and it's in my book, The War of Art. Right. It was kind of a moment uh, when I, um, after running away from writing for years and years, I just kind of pulled out my ancient typewriter and uh, sat down for a couple of hours a night. The first time I'd done it in like seven years and just uh, finally had a moment when it actually worked for me, even though I wasn't producing anything good, obviously, yet, where I actually felt good after sitting down. I felt like the, like I feel coming back from the gym, like I'd done something right. Um, and s small a moment as that sounds like, it was a huge moment because some gear had flipped over in my head and something had changed. I don't know what it was. Now, be it said, after that, it took me like another 25 years after that <laughs> or I actually got something published. It wasn't like wow. anything good happened. But yeah. at least from that point on, uh, the, the, the mechanism in my head was I may start out feeling crazy and hating myself, but by the time I'm through sitting down at the keyboard for a couple of hours or four hours, I feel sane and I feel like I've done my best, you know? Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so that was a turning pro moment for me, Nick, even though I wasn't going to make any money for another 25 years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it sets the stage for you and it builds good habits so that when success does come, you are prepared for it. You know, I have a question for you. Um, you've written so many, so many great novels. You've read a lot of really excellent, uh, historic fiction, historic nonfiction. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you wrote the tome on how to be a writer, really. Uh, between all of these works, especially in between novels, which can really take a lot of time, when you're in between novels and you sit down to write, what are some things that you end up writing? Do you always commit to whatever the next story idea is or whatever the next novel is? Or are there these in-between times where you're still writing every day um, and you're coming up with just kind of the unknown when you sit down. Uh, I'm a big believer, you know, Nick, that there shouldn't be any in between times. Um, and uh, so I really, as I'm working on one particular book, a side of my mind and literally hours of the day that I'll, I'll be trying to figure out what's the next thing. And I really want to know what the next thing is while I'm still in the one I'm working on. Um, and, and I, and I'll try, I'll start working on the next one, kind of cheat a few hours here and there to get something going. Okay. And, uh, I'll do my thing. You guys know my sort of method, my fool's cap method, which we yeah. can talk about sometimes if you want that's, to. That's actually but one of my questions. Of a, a way of, uh, getting your arms around a new project and sort of, um, blocking it out in your mind in a way that you can evaluate it and say, do I really want to do this? Is this any good? Do I think it has any potential? Is yeah. it not a dead end? Is it going somewhere? Mm -hmm. And I really like to, when I finish one book, to have the other book, the next book, already started, you know, and a real yeah. beachhead in it. And the only time I'll let myself take a vacation is when I feel like I've got some momentum like I've landed on the beach at Normandy and I've pushed <laughs> yep. in another 10 or 15 miles mm -hmm. enough. Yeah. So I know that the, the Nazis are not going to drive me back into the sea. <laughs> and then I'll take a vacation when I know I've got a little bit of momentum. Yeah, okay. that's smart. 
Well, and it allows you to take your ideas with you when you go on vacation because you have that momentum built up. Yeah, exactly. Okay, yeah. Exactly. Man, we went to Prague one year. Uh, it's the only time I'd ever been to Europe. And um, I got so many notes out of that. I was able to write a whole novel, a whole novel about uh, a blind Greek mercenary hoplite. So, you know, it's so but you have those ideas beforehand and then you go on your trip and then you're like, oh, this will work for my trip. This will work. You know, mm -hmm. this will work for my book. This will be great. You know, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Um, what habits don't work for you that you see other people recommending? Ah, that's a good one. Um, uh, that's a good one. Uh, I'm not really sure. <laughs> uh, I'm certainly a believer in not overworking something in a, in a particular day. Not to, I'm not, I can't write like for 10 hours straight. No. I know, John, that you said you do that sometimes. <laughs> I, I can't of. do that. I'm definitely, uh, I don't believe... I think you have to keep in mind that a novel or any long form thing, like they say, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing at the gym, right? Yeah. You have to sort of look at the at a, at almost a year at a time, I think, you know, can yeah. I get anywhere in a year? Cause you're not going to get anywhere in a week or in a day. So, mm -hmm. um, at the same time, as I'm kind of hard on myself and I really get up early and I really never miss a day, I will, I'll be a little easier on myself too. I won't, like if, I remember watching, I have some friends in Kentucky, we all go out to the track and watch them train horses. And one of the interesting really? things is that the trainers don't really work these thoroughbreds that hard. You know, really? they'll... They'll get them out on the track. They'll learn they have to run, you know, or to keep turning left. And they'll work with them in the starting gate and stuff like that. But they won't run them into the ground. They won't run them to exhaustion. Yeah. And I think that uh, that's that's a, something that I try, that I see other people try, and that it does not work for me. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. It's easy to get burnt out when you try to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, these um, days, people are so impatient. Everybody wants quick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm. yeah. A life hack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's <laughs> well, yeah, it's the age of the hack for sure. Yeah. There's no there's no life hack to writing a novel. You know, you just do but if there is, the closest thing you're gonna get is probably something like <laughs> one of the books you've written, you yeah. know. Um but so much of the advice that you give in these books has to do with humility and consistency and hard work, you know? So I have another question for you. Um, you've been bringing a lot of attention to this lately on your in, in Instagram page specifically. You've been talking about the fool's cap fool's cap method. So for, for people who haven't heard of this, what is the fool's cap and who is Norm Stahl? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, first of all, the, the word fool's cap, which I had never even heard before. I heard it from my friend. Fool's cap is a, uh, a yellow legal pad, you know, a long page. And, um, years and years ago when I was uh, really, really struggling with the first novel or two, and really, really lost. I have a friend and a mentor named Norm Stahl, who's a documentarian and a writer of all kinds, a screenwriter and a novelist. And he took me out to lunch and he could see that I was like near suicidal and just couldn't get my shit together at all. He took out a sheet of yellow fool's cap, a pad, a legal pad from his, and he said, Steve, God made a single sheet of yellow fool's cap to be exactly the right length to hold the outline of a full novel. Mm -hmm. And that was a real breakthrough for me. The, the, just the idea that you could somehow get it all on one page, not some lengthy Bible that had, you know, yeah. the, the life histories of every character and that, or an outline that had, you know, 800 scenes on it. 
-hmm. that it was possible that the discipline of trying to put it all on one page, however abbreviated, would really help you. Uh, like if you were, if you were designing a, a house and you had to do it on one page, you could do it, right? You could say, you know, a little sketch of where the, where the place is going to be, where the kitchen's going to be, where the front door is. And you would at least get a sense of what you wanted. And it's the same thing for a book. If you've got act one, act two, act three, well, we could go into great detail about it, but it's just doing it on one page really helps. Yeah. One of my favorite things that one of my favorite pieces of advice that you gave was uh, to write the, 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 the climactic sequence, the big scene first to write how it, how everything resolves first, roughly, I think is how, how you, how you said it. And then, and then go back. Do you do that when you're, uh, when you're using the full scat method and you're putting everything down on one page, do you I still do. have that same approach? I, I do. It's a, it's really a kind of a technique that you learn in screenwriting. That's the way most people write movies, right? Oh, okay. Um, if you start with uh, Captain Ahab locked up with Moby Dick, you know, plunging this harpoon into him as they fight to the death, then you can sort of work backwards from there, right? Yeah. There's got to be a long chase. There's got to be a history between them where they hate each other. There's got to be <laughs> an almost moment where they almost get together, et cetera, yep. et cetera. And then you can go all the way back to the initial start of the voyage. And... Uh, it, it's, it's definitely a great discipline. I haven't done it on everything, but it, it's a great way to do it. Um, I'll give you the opposite story. I think I might've told you guys this. One of, one of my books is called Killing Rommel. Yeah. And it's about, it takes place in World War II in the North Africa campaign. And it's about a British special forces unit that goes, is assigned to go behind the lines in North Africa and try to kill the great German general, Erwin Rommel. And I real I had written like nine tenths of the book. Absolutely, this is all true. And I realized I had no scene in the with Rommel in it. And I said, <laughs> I said, Steve, don't you think you ought to have a scene with him in this thing? You know. So, <laughs> had I been smart, I would have started with that scene and known exactly what it was. And then I would have worked backwards from there. So yeah. okay. it, it all worked out in the end, but I was really an idiot to work that way. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, sometimes you don't know until you, you know, or until you're in the pickle, how to get out of the pickle. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm going to take your advice. Uh, I just finished, uh, I just finished a kid's book and that's kind of, we're, we're beginning the editing process of that right now, but I'm already itching to start drafting the next book. And I'm going to use the fool's cap and I'm going to start by writing that, yeah. that big scene. Well, Nick, I'm actually, I know you know this. I'm doing a little video series on Instagram right now mm -hmm. about the fool's cap method. Yeah. So anybody can look them up on Instagram. I'm on up to like episode five or six. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. I'm going to be sticking real close to that. I'm going to stick real <laughs> close to that because I really want to try this. I had never heard of, this method before yeah. i'd never heard the term fool's cap before uh, yeah. but the method of just putting everything on one page um that was new to me so this has been this is a really interesting uh really uh, interesting journey i'm going on here yeah yeah uh, hang on one second. yep we're hanging look at that typewriter i know that's so cool and he's got a coat on back there too i don't know yep. if you can see this yeah the authentic this swing. is a book of mine called the authentic swing and it's about it's about the writing of the uh, the Legend of Bagger Vance, and this thing that's on the cover is the fool's cap, the one page thing for the Legend of Bagger Vance. Oh, um, so cool. that's kind of what it that's kind of what it looks like. Okay, that's awesome. Yeah, that's the thing. You know, when you have to work in a confined space like a single page, single yellow page, it teaches you what is wheat and what is chaff, what's important, what needs to stay and how to articulate it. It's kind of like Steve you used to say in, I think it was the war of art, uh, how poets make the best 
novelists because they understand the economy of words, you know, and those kinds of exercises, you know, anything that encourages the economy of words. Um, yeah. Yeah. The yep. fool's cap method is awesome. Yeah. Have you used so, it before? Have you? Have, uh, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. I didn't know it was called that, though. Yeah. <laughs> See, that's a that's a great thing, man. Every time I go, every time anybody goes to your Instagram, like we always learn something new, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's really cool. Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Um, uh, Nick, you had a couple other. You had one in there that was really good for kids, actually. Oh, yeah, because, uh, you know, I write for kids and I have kids and I know that that is not your market. But if Stephen Pressfield had a 10 year old daughter, <laughs> which I understand he doesn't, but if he did and you noticed that she was, uh, you know, she had uh, kind of some talent budding as a little storyteller. Um, how would you like, what kind of advice or help would you give or seek out for her? Cause I'm in that situation with my daughter. What would you advise me to do for her? She's just learning how to tell a story and is thinking about writing wow, books. That's a, oh, that's a great question. It kind of, wow. Uh, I know that's kind of out of left field. Hit you with a curveball. Yeah. Sorry uh, about that. And it requires a lot what? of distilling. I wonder <laughs> if, uh, you could. You can screw a kid up by telling them too much, too soon. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's better to just encourage um, her to just keep going, keep doing it, and find her, find her just to to, to keep the fun in it for her instead mm -hmm. of trying to put her into some kind of uh, uh, structure. You know. Mm -hmm. Again, I don't know. I've never done this. I've never worked with it. Sure, a sure, sure. As a storyteller, so I don't know. But uh, when, when somebody asks me to help them with writing something, which I almost never do, <laughs> the only thing I, I ever really do is just encourage them yeah. and try never to put any negative thing in there at all. Or, or yeah. I think where I'll go wrong when someone asks me to help them, and this is why I don't help people, is what I, what I do is, and this is bad, what I do is I say, well, if I were doing this, this is what I would do, which mm -hmm. is probably the worst advice you could give to anybody. Because what you really want is to let, encourage them to do what their instinct and what their muse tells them. Yeah. Yeah. So, Nick, I would just encourage her. Just, to, you know, whatever she does, tell her it's great. Keep doing it. Don't stop. <laughs> that I can do. That I can do. Because everything she does is really great. <laughs> and she'll love Love to hear that and she so. loves to hear that everything she does is great <laughs> so very cool well yeah. thank you for that i really appreciate you you weighing <laughs> in on that um you mind if i ask another one yeah sure okay. yeah uh so i also think oh but that that's i also think that that's what we should do for ourselves well, yeah it's self-talk you know that at the end of the day nick you did great Keep going, that kind of thing, you know, to ourselves. Yeah. Well, that's the self-reinforcement principle you talk about in your book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, very, very important. It's easy as a writer to hammer on yourself for not achieving what you think you should, you know. Um, so, yeah, yeah, self-reinforcement, very important. Very, very important. I mean, it was one, it's probably the most challenging, it was one of the most challenging things for me in your book personally, because I get down on myself really easily. Yeah. You know, I'm that, uh, and it, you know, and every writer's like that too, in, in, in a way, like they want other people to write their stuff. They're sensitive to criticism, but I'm sensitive to self criticism. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, if I'm, so that's something that I'm, that's something that I'm definitely working on. Yeah. 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 I mean, the definition of resistance with a capital R is our own negative self talk, right? And mm -hmm. so we should not encourage our bad self to keep telling that that's coming in all the time, the negative stuff. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I say in put your ass where your heart wants to be that, that the ability to self reinforce is more important than talent. And I think yeah. it's absolutely true because self reinforcement will keep you going over the years and talent will not. Yeah. Talent will burn out. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. 
have there ever been any books that you were in the middle of steve that like really tested your good habits were there any just nightmare projects that were tough to get through yes i mean it's like almost all of them do <laughs> i mean i i do find i won't say every book but almost every book breaks down in the middle for me yeah i do have a a crisis in the middle somehow because i usually have not thought it through well enough yeah you know i've been lazy and this like nick this is why the foolscap method is really helps because the foolscap method at least the way i do it makes you a ask and answer the really tough questions at the start you know like what's what's the climax right what's the midpoint where everything turns what's mm -hmm. that scene you know um yeah. What's the theme? What's it about? Which we always, at least me, yeah. I want to gloss over. I want to cheat and not really answer that question. And then halfway through, the story falls apart. And you have to kind of, you know, this is where my working with my great editor, Sean Coyne, mm -hmm. has helped me so many times over the years. Because when I hit that moment where everything falls apart, that's when you really need help. You need another gosling in there that you can <laughs> talk to, you know. Mm -hmm. because somebody else can come in and kind of see where you've, you've lost the trail. But yeah, yeah so it, it almost always happens, John, almost always. It'll break yeah. down in the middle. And that, in a way, that's what separates the men from the boys, you know, mm -hmm. when mm -hmm. you can somehow rally and keep going. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I have it right now. And it's the same thing. It's always in the middle. It's always the middle section. And like, even right now, I have a chapter that I have been trying to figure out for two weeks now, and it is brutal on a book that I wrote 10 years ago that I'm just <laughs> trying to finish up, you know, and it's just like, this should not be that hard. Yeah. But sometimes it's just, it's just a, a you know, a stone that you're just trying to bash with your head, yeah. you know, and, uh, and yeah, it's just not giving up on it, you know, and just keep going for me it was the end of the book i just finished really i got down to yeah because the end was not the thing i wrote first it was the thing i wrote last right uh just thinking well it's the end i kind of have an idea of how i want everything to resolve but i didn't think through it at all and i got to close to the end close to that big final scene and yeah it fell apart it took me forever yeah it took me forever to to just bang it out and then wipe it and then do it again yeah um and We'll see. Uh, my editor might say, mm, I don't like the ending, <laughs> but I had to at least get it done. <laughs> so but and that's where it fell apart for me. Yeah. 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 Uh, well, you talk about doing the ending first or having that scene or what you want out of the ending written down first. I always saw that as a great anchor point, uh, like the Heavenly Realms series. I wish that I had written all of the books first before I published a single one because you you find things along the way that you think oh this is a great idea I wish I had known about this when I wrote chapter one or book <laughs> one so I could plant the seed for it you know and have that cathartic build up and and pay off and nobody can really afford to do it. everybody you know what I mean like it's kind of asking too much of a writer to have them write the whole series first before they publish anything but Having your ending is really important because that's what everything is building towards. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's the it's the aircraft carrier that the F-14 is going to land on. Yeah. What if the know? Death Star didn't blow up? Right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And that's a dumb analogy. I'm sorry. That was dumb. I should see. Said there's that, that. there's a negative self talk that he's always <laughs> on about, you know, I swear. Yeah. You know, I, I, um, let me I want to. Let me recommend a book for our listeners here that yep. maybe yeah. they haven't heard of. This is by David Mamet, the great playwright and screenwriter. Yeah. It's called Three, Three Uses of the Knife. Have we ever talked about this, you guys? No, no never heard about this. Ah, it's uh, yeah, Three Uses of the Knife. It's a short book. Okay. Yeah, he, he really gets into the second act horrors, you know. 
and what 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 it's all about. and it makes you feel like if if mammoth's dealing with this then maybe the rest of us are not so screwed up to be dealing with it too yeah 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 and you want to talk about a genius uh david mammoth is amazing um his movie spartan that he wrote with val kilmer there are some scenes in that movie that like you have to have like a 150 IQ to write that thing. Yeah. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Three uses of the knife yes. by David Mamet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, will you spoil it for us and tell us what the three uses of the knife are? Or do we need to go get the book and read it? You know, I've read the book like five <laughs> times. I still don't know what the three uses are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. It's good to know. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Right. Yeah. Fair enough. Um, one of our, uh, patrons and fellow published, uh, self-published authors, Jay Reese Bradley had a great question. Uh, she wanted to know if you have ever written to market or have you always only written for your passions? Uh, uh that's a great question. Uh, I'll, I'll say this, that when I try to write for a market, Mm -hmm. I'm wrong. I'm always wrong, yeah. you know, and the, the books that have worked for me have been things that came from my heart and that I thought truly, truly thought there was no market for really thought like I'm the only person that will be interested in this. Like, like, uh, even gates of fire that now mm -hmm. is a, you know, a million seller book. When I started it, if you think about it, a story of a battle from 2,500 years ago. Nobody's ever heard of. They can't spell it. They can't pronounce it. It's <laughs> yep. from Americans only care about Americans. This is another country with the names of all the characters are unpronounceable. Nobody knows how to say them. Yeah. Why would anybody want to do this book? But I was just seized by it. I love the story. So, and then it turned out to work. So, the bottom line for me is when I follow my instincts, it comes out better than when I, when I think I've got a real surefire project, it, it always just fizzles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it, I remember uh, reading an interview of yours probably 15 years ago of where you talked about that very thing that Gates of Fire seemed like just a, you know, a small thing that you and your handful of fellow historical friends, you know, your historian friends would be interested in. And yet it's on the Marine Corps Commandant's reading list. It has been, you know, a, a million bestseller multiple times over. It is the benchmark, in my mind at least, of historical fiction. It is one of the greatest novels ever written. And yet at the time, it totally just felt like, you know, a passion project for you. You know, it's funny how it works. I have a confession <laughs> to make about Gates of Fire. Oh, OK, let's hear it. It was the first non-fantasy yeah. novel that I ever read. <laughs> I read it when I was 25, really? uh, I think. Yeah, uh, 24, 24, 25. Okay. And uh yeah, it was the first yeah first novel that I wrote that I read that wasn't you know a fantasy novel that wasn't and Lord I was of the like Rings. this and my older brother gave it to me yeah he gave me a copy of it he said oh man this book's great this guy Stephen Bradley he's awesome you got to read this book mm -hmm. so I'm like oh cool Good. everything that my big brother liked I was totally into you know and same yeah, yeah. and I I read it I'm like oh my gosh this is amazing I gave it to Jonathan I'm like you got to read this book yeah it's really good yeah and then they kept on reading other people's stuff. And I was like, who is this Pressfield guy? This is awesome. Yeah. Like, you know, and then next thing you know, yeah, like Tides of War and uh, the Virtues of War. Um, Steve, I got a question for you that uh, came up in an interview that I was doing with Jay Reese Bradley. We were talking about finding your writer's voice. And I know you've touched on this briefly in the past in the War of Art. Um, I wanted to ask you, how did you find your writer's voice? And I wanted to maybe have a conversation with you about exploring how people can find their voices as well. Uh, 
Uh, it's a great, that's a great question, Jonathan. I think for, for me, um, it, it arose and it arises from the specific book, like in, let's say, Gates of Fire. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm deciding that I'm going to tell the story from the point of view, in the first person, from the point of view of a squire, an armor bearer, to the hero of the, of the battle, the true Spartan Dionikos. So that kind of establishes your voice. So it's not my voice, yeah. right? In a way, I'm like an actor in a role and trying to speak as that person. And that, to me, I think really freed me up quite a bit. And I would imagine that if we were um, Scott Fitzgerald and we were writing The Great Gatsby, once you come up with the character of Nick Carraway, mm -hmm. that's the character that's telling the story, then you just sort of imagine yourself into that person and speak in his, in his or her voice. And I think that uh, that's kind of what I've done with, with every book um, is uh, try to find, it's not really my voice. It's yeah. the, it's the character's voice. Um, uh, yeah. I, I don't know if you do, if you ever do write with quote unquote, your voice, I mean, even if you think about Hemingway, um, where his book seemed so much like it was him talking, I don't know if they really were. I think that was a character that he invented, you know, and it shifted <laughs> from, from, from book to book. Yeah. I've noticed that your voice shifts from book to book, so that makes perfect sense. Now, there's always this specific vernacular and way of writing that you have uh, that I really love. Um, but I noticed after you wrote uh, The Virtues of War, which was uh, narrated uh, by Alexander the Great, which talk about a lofty aspiration, you know, ballsy, pretty ballsy to write a, you know, a book where Alexander the Great's the narrator. Uh, and then you go on to um, the Afghan campaign, which was written uh, from the perspective of a Macedonian um, phalangite, a Macedonian soldier. And the voices are totally different. And you can tell from page one. It was very, very impressive. Yeah. I think, you know, in a way, Jonathan, it really is like the career of an actor. Like if you think about yeah. Meryl Streep, think about the parts that she's played, the many, many, many parts. And she's completely different in each one, right? Because, I mean, she's still her. She's still Meryl Streep. Right. But she can be, you know, um, Karen Silkwood in the nuclear plant. Or she can be Karen Blixen in Out of Africa. She can be, she enters into a role and sort of turns, gives herself over to that role. I think that's, that's what, that's what I do. I don't know. What do you guys do when you're, when you're getting into a, you know, in the heavenly realms or in the children's realms. <laughs> How do you find your voice? Nick? Uh, well, I mean, I, I think it revolves around the main character. Yeah. Like uh, I wrote a, I wrote a story called uh, Easel Bancroft's worst day ever. <laughs> and it was about this sarcastic, self-righteous, pretentious homeschool kid who had to actually go to public school for one year and had a, uh, just, in his mind, he's just like he just thinks he's better than everyone, and he gets mm -hmm. wrapped up in this drama that, that ends up humbling him. Uh, but it was that—that's where the voice came from. It was his disgust for the world around him. That was his voice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So yeah, I mean, it was character based, and that makes total sense because you know, because when I'm writing, I, I'm thinking, is this what is my yeah? You know, what is my voice? Am I supposed to? Is there spo supposed to be spoken some kind of consistent sound or feel mm -hmm. between all of my books? I don't know. I always assumed that there was, but I wasn't, I've never really done that. So yeah. I didn't know if I was off base by just trying to write what my characters want to think and say and do in their, in their unique ways, or I, I, I don't know. So this has actually been really, uh, uh reaffirming. Really. Yeah. Yeah. That's the great thing about, uh, doing first person perspective 
is you get to stretch your 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 author's acting ability you mm -hmm. know and you do you have to think like okay because i have two or three books uh in the heavenly realm series that are first person perspective um you know most of the time it's third person but there are some exceptions there and yeah you have to think like would my character say it like this and would my character describe this and also would my character even though this is an important part of the story would my character actually admit to this part of the story yeah. or would he just gloss over it you know yeah. and so it's just first person perspective is so much fun it's risky because you're not getting to fill in all the details because your character doesn't see it. they're not omniscient but the fun you get to have it's tough it's not easy but have you ever been tempted to um, to sort of dovetail over into third person? Uh, into third person? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it was hard for me, but like a man at arms mm -hmm. is in third person. And the one that I'm working on now is in third person. And, oh, really? you know, one thing I found, I'm sure you guys have found this too, is that you can write a character that's more intelligent than you are. Oh, yeah. You All know? my characters are smarter and, than me. So. And, uh, and you can, you really can. And even if you're not, uh, even in the third person, you can write more intelligently than you actually are, mm -hmm. you know? And I find myself sometimes using bigger words than I would normally use. Uh -huh. and, yeah. But then again, you're, you are, even in the third person, you're sort of inserting yourself into another, another being than yeah. yourself you know you're mm -hmm. writing out of another place maybe a higher a higher level and mm -hmm. that's a big part of the fun of it because then yeah. i'm sure you know you have this too you guys is ideas will come out of your head that you didn't even know you had yep and yep. where you look at those ideas later and you go wow that's pretty fucking smart you know <laughs> right how, how did i come up with that and of course you realize that <laughs> You really yeah. didn't. It's coming from somewhere else, you know? Yes. Yeah. 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 That's the, that is the beauty and uh, the freedom of the humility of re like when you realize that the humility that you get out of that, of realizing that you are, you are not the conductor, you are the instrument, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's like faith. It's liberating because you're able to just let go and just be the conduit, you know, just play the song. You're not making up the song. You're just letting the force flow through you, you yeah. know, and it takes a yeah, lot of stress. Very, off. It's very much like improv. I mean, in a way, yeah. too, it's like if when you're a kid and you get busted for something, right? And <laughs> a principal or a cop or your mom or your dad have got you dead to rights. And on the spur of the moment, you come up with some bullshit story. <laughs> and as yep. it's spooling out, you're saying to yourself, <laughs> Where this am I coming up with this stuff from? You know, <laughs> no, I fell yeah. in the river. And my brother jumped in. He got me. And it was an alligator. We came out of it. It's like Donald Trump talking. You, know? you, just, you don't know just, where it's coming oh. from, but yep. it is amazing. That's basically all fiction writing is, right? It's yeah. just, just, yeah, just making it up on the fly. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any um, any habits or any extracurricular non writing activities that help you maintain uh, that sort of actor's mentality towards a voice? Like, do you read nonfiction? Do you read poetry? Is there anything you do to supplement or help that? I uh, I'm a big movie person. I watch a million movies. Okay, and and. Uh, Brad, I don't usually read novels, which I probably should, but I'm much more of a nonfiction reader, but, but mainly it's movies for me. And I'll watch, you know, the movies that I love, I've, I've seen 15 times, you know, I'll, I'll watch, you know, uh, uh, Pulp Fiction or Kill Bill number mm -hmm. two or mm -hmm. um, The Godfather or something. I'll watch them over, you know, yeah. anytime it comes on, I'll get hooked by it and I'll do it again. And I yeah. do think that, and but I do think any kind of art, music, painting, dance, anything at all, is it's just great to have it coming in, um, yeah. even if you don't steal from it exactly. Although I'm yeah. always looking to steal things, but <laughs> it's, it's inspiring to see great stuff. You know, 
you yeah. come out of a great movie or watching a, or reading a great book and you say, you know, I got to sit down. I got to do, I got to try and do what this guy did. You know, yeah, it's yeah. like watching Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant or something like that. Yeah. When you watch anybody, then you, you're just inspired to try harder yourself. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm that way with, I'm that way with several of the Godfather. You mentioned the Godfather, that whole saga, uh, man, I've watched it a dozen times, the whole thing a dozen times. I got to ask one, two or three, which is the best. I'm a two guy. I think part two is the superior yeah. film, but <laughs> where is Stephen Fry? And, and it's okay. They're all great. You're not, you're not demeaning any of them, but do you have a favorite of the trilogy? Oh, another thing I would say on this subject is I love to read stuff from other eras, particularly okay. from the deep past, you know, really? um, I, I love the ancient Greeks. I love the Romans. I love, uh, mm -hmm. you know, anything in the middle ages, anything like that. <clears throat> um, it's very inspiring and very freeing. I, I'm not sure why, maybe yeah. because, you know, there's a tremendous pressure on us, I think, living in the, the democrat a democratic world small d democratic where we're all supposed to be equal there's a very an unspoken pressure to dumb ourselves down right we don't mm -hmm. want to try to be too smart you know because then well, people will say well who do you think you are using a four syllable word you know but when you go when you read the classics and you read you know you read xenophon or thucydides or herodotus they yeah. were not afraid to be intelligent, you know. They were not afraid to say, you know, to go really deep. And it's inspiring, I think, to do that. It kind of frees you up to say, shit, if they can do it, I can do it too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I, I love to read the other other uh, eras. Yeah. It, not that your writing was another era, but that, ex that exact thing that you're talking about was my experience with Gates of Fire. Um, and then also with uh with the afghan campaign uh and with um the virtues of war uh tides of war most of your ancient historical fiction uh really inspired me in that same way where i saw i saw a man who you know a writer who created this work that was equal parts masculine brutality and also elegant and beautiful in the language, not just in the characters and the things that were happening, but just the, the language of the writing, the prose. Mm. And I, and there were tons of words that I had never heard of before. I like every one of your books has sent me to the dictionary and I love that. And it, it influenced my writing to where I just I basically, it <laughs> <laughs> no, I stole it all. Either. So, you know, <laughs> Another thing I love to, that does inspire me, Jonathan, is to read tr nonfiction accounts by the person that actually lived it, like war stories about so-and-so that parachutes yeah. behind the enemy lines or that kind of thing. Or, um, you know, a, a book I really love is uh, Joshua Slocum's Sailing Alone Around the World. I don't know if you've ever yes. read that. but Twice. But, of course, there are... Uh, yeah. There yep. are a million books like that, but I love to read these true stories yeah. by these guys that have performed incredible heroic stuff, mountain climbers, that kind of it, because those are the characters you want, we want for our own heroes. Yeah. And it reinforces a lot of times I'll be writing something for a hero of mine and I'll be having them do something or say something. And I'll think to myself, could a real person really do this? Is this like too much like, uh, you know, Dwayne Johnson you know, or something like that? <laughs> but that's why it's great to read stories like Shackleton or mm -hmm. The Conquest of Annapurna or something like that. Because mm -hmm. you realize, damn right, there are real guys that do this stuff yeah. and real women. And, and they're a great humility, too. A lot of them have amazing humility while yeah. they're doing incredible stuff you know yeah so i love to read that that's always inspiring yeah you know ordeals that people survived you know it's great mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i felt the same way about uh did you ever see that movie 13 hours uh with no, uh, john I krasinski I, but I know the one you mean yeah great movie and 
um, based off of a book that the survivors got together and kind of wrote, you know, and uh, off of their experiences, you know, surviving the assault in Benghazi. And that movie, in listening to the interviews and the audio commentary and everything with the survivors, uh, those guys talk about that movie being about 98% accurate. There really were only two things in that movie that were not the same as reality. And one was for national security reasons, and the other was just for Hollywood movie making reasons. Like the RPGs. When an RPG shoots... Apparently, it doesn't have a smoke trail in real life like you see in the movies. That's just uh, Hollywood. Right. And then the other thing was like the uh, the the main bad guy who worked for the CIA in the base who wouldn't let him go, wouldn't take him off the leash and let him go save the ambassador. You know, that guy in reality is two guys instead of one. Yep. Everything else in that movie, 100 percent really happened. Cool. And then there's Very all cool. these other things that happened in the movie that are even that are more extravagant, weird, funny that weren't included in the movie. And, you know, it teaches you when you read nonfiction and you, you know, you see these or you watch a a memoir or something. It teaches you that like real life can be way zanier and weirder and wilder than anything you you can come up with. And like, do you ever get that feeling that it just sort of frees you to kind of do whatever you want with your writing at that point? Or do you feel like "Ah, I should probably no, it does. Pull it back a little bit. It does for you. And also, what's interesting to me a lot of times about that real life stuff, like, um, have you ever read uh, With the Old Breed by E.B. Sledge? Mm-mm. With the Old Breed. It's about Marine Corps infantry in the Pacific. Yep. Nice. And what's so interesting to me is the way these guys who are real heroes, the way they think of themselves, yeah. you know, and they don't think of themselves as heroes at all. Right. You know, they, they're just, you know, doing a job. And so for, for me to try to craft a hero, I want to try to use that, use that, you know, yeah, that uh, to try to talk the same way those guys talk, you know? And of course, yeah. when you meet people in real life, that's that are like that as well. That's a whole other uh, inspiration. Yeah. I realized that when I was uh, training with Tonto, Peranto, one of the guys from Benghazi, Uh we were out at Treadproof. This is about like three or four years ago. And we're discussing just some mechanics, whether or not I should, what kind of foregrip I should have. He was helping me with my grip on my AR as we're running these courses. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, what do you think? You you know, I was thinking about putting this kind of grip. Do you think I should hold back here? Like, what's better? And Peronda Tonto, just without missing a beat, exactly like what you're talking about, Steve, was just like, you know what? Whatever works for you is great. I got my way of doing it. That works for me. But you do you, you know? And I did not expect that coming from a guy of his caliber, you know, an, an army ranger, CIA asked that survivor of one of the most horrific battles, you know, uh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, the humility thing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and hearing stories about people who are actually really there, really in the action, being inspiring. Is uh, is there some of that behind why you wrote the Lions Gate? Does that tie into your writing yeah. of, of the Lions Gate? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. Nick. I just was, you know, that uh, that was very inspirational to me. Interviewing the Lions Gate is about the Six Day War, the Arab Israeli War of 1967. And to write that, I went to Israel for nine weeks and I interviewed pilots and tankers and stuff like that. And it was a real eye opener for me because almost all of the stories involved a, a, a screw up of some kind. <laughs> Guys would tell you how, you know, they got into this position and they didn't know how to get out of it, you know. And and uh, so they were they did tremendously heroic things like. I'm just thinking of one thing when um, the first Israeli uh, Air Force attack against the Egyptian air bases on the first day of the war, the preemptive strike, the way the pilots had to come in was they had to come in 100 feet off the deck. And on, and Whoa. then they would climb to 6,000 feet and invert. And so they're looking up through the top of the canopy straight down towards the and. A couple of guys did that, leading their squadrons, their their formations of four, 
And they looked down and there was no airfield there. They were like lost. They went, they took oh, a wrong man. turn, you know, and they had to like, in that moment, they had to like go back, retrace their steps, oh, knowing geez. that that by being late, they were screwing up everything for everybody else, everything. you know, yeah. but somehow they did it. They did it. And that's wow. inspirational, not just as a hero stories, but for like you and me as we're writing books, you know, it's like, yeah, we screw up too. It's not quite as dangerous as, you know, <laughs> being a guy at 600 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, the stakes aren't quite as high. There's not a, no. there's not a small nations, you know, but uh, it does show you what, what true action heroes do, what they really yeah. like. Israel would have lost the war if I had been in that situation. It would have been, <laughs> you over. guys, I hate to, I hate to pull the plug here, but I, oh, yeah. have, to, I have to get out of here yeah. in the next couple of minutes. No Absolutely. worries. No worries. Steve, this has been great. Thank you. Yeah, uh, this is always so much fun. Uh, we hope to have you back for the next fireside chats with Uncle Steve in a few months. Uh, we're hoping to do these every quarter. Uh, where can people find you, real quick, for anybody who might be wondering? Okay, I'd love to do it with you guys. This is great fun. So consider me as long as you want to have me. I'll keep coming back to do this. This is great. You're <laughs> awesome. You're awesome. Stephen great. Pressfield. Thank you, sir. Uncle Steve. We really uh, we appreciate it. it. It's great to be your uncle, you guys. You're you're <laughs> the you best, Jonathan, man. I'll see you, Nick. All right. Yeah, see you later. Have a great guys. All right. Bye. Bye. Cool. I think there was a little uh there may have been a might be my audio. microphone. I think my microphone think so? might have uh, some issues yeah. on it too, because yeah. I think you were coming through okay, but I think my audio would probably yeah. drop out. We were having That's a good. ton of audio issues before we got started, and we're gonna—I'm gonna look into like doing anything I can on our end to yeah. try and bolster that for yeah. the next round. So it's yeah, we'll, we'll figure yeah. it out. That was awesome, yeah. though. That was awesome, though. Great advice. A lot of man, as gold. always, solid yeah. gold. I'm gonna timestamp uh, the video so you guys can go back and watch. Yeah, you know the the parts where he's just just dropping the nuggets man <laughs> just dropping them nuggets he's the laying juice. the golden eggs it's all the places where he's just squeezing all the juice out it's just it's just napalm of yeah. wisdom yeah mm-hmm. um uh so uh yeah it, and it may have been yeah it may have been uh, there was a i know that uh jonathan was asking a question there at the end and i don't think the tail end of the question got through yeah it may have gotten cutting off on his end uh, and he didn't answer my question about Godfather. And I think it was because he actually didn't hear it. I think it got cut probably. Off. Yeah. So uh, apologies there, guys. But uh, thanks for everyone for. Uh, yeah. Thanks hanging for watching, around. everyone. Yeah. It's yeah. been really cool. Really fun. Absolutely. We'll um, do this again. And we have uh, we have something set up with Steve where we're going to do these every quarter. Yeah. So and yeah. Uh, they're going to promote it more on their uh, on their end, like on Instagram and everything, yeah. I think. So it's going to be really cool. And yeah. Steve and Diana have been incredibly sweet and generous to us. They and uh, they are amazing awesome. people. And uh, you can find Steve at stevenpressfield.com. Right. He has an Instagram that he stays pretty active on. It's just Stephen Pressfield. Um, P R E S S F I E L D. Much like the Goslings. He's a double S guy. Yeah. He's. You know? <laughs> And he spells his name Stephen the right way with a V. Yeah, it's not Stefan. I didn't put Stefan Pressfield in his. You better not. Have. Let me just double check I here. Will, I'm going to pull it back up. I will hurt you. Uh, no, you got it right. Did I get it right? You get to live it right another week. I, I spelled yeah. it right. Okay. Yeah, I'm a writer. <laughs> I do more. <laughs> so sometimes he's more. Of a, sometimes we're more of a wronger than a writer. Yeah, for so, real. Uh, uh, this might be like uh, you know the last several guests we've gone like two hours, two and a half hours. Yeah, this is the shortest one we've had. Yeah, and he told us he had only had an hour when we uh, when we logged on earlier today. Yeah. So and uh, we lost some time due to the technical stuff. We were yeah. trying to get the microphone situation yeah. worked out. So. Yeah. Oh well, that's yeah. right. Maybe this is a record for the shortest one that we've done. It probably is, yeah. man. Yeah. Yeah. Which means it's Honestly. the most packed with good stuff yeah yeah quality yeah. over quantity you know <laughs> yeah it dense it's the condensed yeah. milk of interviews for the <laughs> goslings you know but i say that but like here's the thing we also had gabe we also had gabe for an hour we thought we were gonna because we did that we recorded that at nine o'clock at night our time on started, a monday started at nine yeah and we thought like i thought man that's pretty late for nick that's kind of late for me too like yeah i'm normally man bad. we're gonna you know and we talked to gabe and we're like yeah we're gonna have gabe for an hour and it ended up being almost like almost three hours three hours it's like two hours and 40 minutes yeah we were like that we had yeah it was three hours 
awesome. Yeah, it was great. Well, it was, yeah, I was fading though towards the end. You guys probably noticed. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I felt it the next day, but it was worth it, man. It, it was awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, it's nice to do one of these though on the, you know, that's kind of different where, you know, we're, we're right at an hour and, uh, you know, it's it's really fun. And we, like Nick said, we get a ton of stuff packed in there. Yeah. So you you get some variety with the goslings. You can have the awesome, sprawling, epic conversation like what we have with Gabe or like with Derek and Gary, Gary Wayne. Man, yeah. You know, uh, we're going to have those guys back, by the way, yep. uh, on separate Coming occasions. Soon. Yep. yep. Um, you have those long form interviews and then you have these uh where we kind of get just a ton of stuff packed into an yeah. hour and it's it's a lot more user friendly for some people who you know may not you know have a whole day yep. to <laughs> listen to right. a two and a half hour goslings right <laughs> right session, so and next week's gonna be good uh we're gonna have steven ty and his colleague Jim oh, talking about yeah. their uh, uh their paranormal investigators right so they're gonna be talking about their experiences and sharing some cool stuff with us yeah uh they might they had some uh examples some data from their research or i think recordings maybe some images that they might share as well I know yeah i'm kind of i'm talking with them by email right now but that's gonna be next week our halloween episode it's gonna be cool you want to be awesome yeah and then uh, we want to thank everybody in the comments um we had a couple new faces in the comments um overbuilt i think uh yeah. was one of well them. he's not new he's been on several times actually overbuilt uh he's been on several times I overbuilt automotive I have not seen him Mike, uh, of course. I apologize, Shannon, Overbuilt. My Jerry's. memory probably is just crap. Uh, Harvey, appreciate you weighing in. <laughs> awesome nickname or awesome username, by the way, Harvey. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Nice. <laughs> uh, great. Really great. I appreciate everyone. I don't uh, know who in on Harvey Weinstein is, but his sense of humor is like pure goslings. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, and then Mama Shay asked, uh, let's see, Shannon asked, which books of his would you recommend to start out with? I would, for me, fiction or nonfiction. I'll give one of each. All right, I give one of each. I would say for fiction, for me, um, Gates of Fire, and then nonfiction, The War of Art. Uh, I think I know what your answer would be. Go ahead. Uh, my answer for fiction would be Man at Arms. Really? Yeah. For, I thought you were going to say fiction. For fiction, really? more so than the Legend of Bagger Vance. Mm -hmm. Yep. Really? Okay. Yep, yep. I am glad I did not put money on this. Yeah, I would say if, if it were me and I had to, because I've read them all. Uh, and I would, if I were starting over and I was like, which one am I going to read first? It'd be a man at arms. I have think so. Tempted to read it again already. Yeah. yeah. And then for nonfiction, of course, the war of art. You got to start yeah. with the war of art. I would say the war of art and then. Yeah. Put your ass where your heart wants in to this be. one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah th this is this is deep, man. And he has, uh, you know, I wonder, like, I always hesitate to list his books because there are so many like we'll just go down the nonfiction list for Stephen Pressfield the war of art turning pro do the work the warrior ethos the authentic swing and then nobody wants to read your shit and the artist's journey and then he has two others in here the lion's gate and an American Jew uh, but those are those are not uh, motivational in nature you know, these as far as, you know, being uh, being self-actualized in your writing or your creativity. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And then his fiction speaks for itself. Uh, the Virtues of War is about Alexander the Great. And that is probably one of his most popular mm -hmm. um, of all of his ancient Greco. Yeah. Fiction. If I would say, though, if you're if you're a Christian. If you're a Christian, a man at arms, a man at arms is where you start. Yeah. Start with the man at arms. First it's going to resonate yeah. with you big time. Oh, and and then go to the legend of Bagger Vance and then gates of fire. Yeah. And then everything else he's ever written. Cause yeah. it's amazing. That ending in a man at arms. Oh yeah. Is <laughs> perfect. Yeah. I, I, I genuinely could not have, I could there. I walked away from that book, not nitpicking or thinking I wanted anything else. Yeah. You know what I mean? I do. Sometimes you get to the end of a of a book or a movie and you think, man, I really wish that character had lived or I wish that bad guy had died mm -hmm. or, you know, I wish they had killed Prince Humperdinck, <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever. Right. But man, you get to the end of a man at arms. Humperdinck, Humperdinck, yeah, Humperdinck. Humperdinck. I'm not listening. <laughs> Good luck storm in the castle. <laughs> you think it'll work? You're going to take a miracle. Shut up. 
Shut up, you witch. I'm not a witch. I'm your wife. Yeah, same difference. <laughs> uh, oh, uh, De Blunt Truth says, as a screenwriter, this was extremely ex insightful interview. Thank you, brothers. Man, absolutely. Thank you. Um, I appreciate it. I really I, appreciate I, I you saying you enjoyed that. it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you you gotta do, I'm gotta, I got to do that fool's cap. I'm, I'm serious. I'm going to be using fool's the fool's cap, cap method, method on, on this next book. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You cannot go wrong with any of Stephen Pressfield's works. Uh, his website uh you definitely want to uh follow him on his website and i'll i'll give you a story we didn't have time for me to get to this uh and i'm kicking myself for it i'm gonna have to save it for next time but probably leave you with this since we can kind of wrap up a little early here um one of the bad habits one of the methods that resistance gets me has always been video games or computer games because they create a false, not just all the stimulus response, but they also create a false sense of accomplishment. So you think like, oh, if I could just beat this boss or if I could mm -hmm. just beat this level or like if I could just upgrade my civilization to this, I'd be, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. <laughs> and um, you can burn a lot of time doing that. And even to this day, I still wrestle with it sometimes. Um, never goes away. However, <clears throat> uh one of the games like there have been a lot of games that have uh, inspired and helped my writing over the years, um, you know, whether it was uh, the aesthetic of Thief, the dark project, whether it was the role reversal of TIE Fighter, uh, whether it was sort of the fun pop culture symposium of Halo uh, or Rome Total War. And um, the and Rome Total War became uh, a real beauty from ashes kind of thing uh, as far as my resistance being used by God to be turned into something beneficial mm -hmm. because I used Rome Total War as a research tool for the books. So like I had all these ancient battle, these ancient looking battles, you know, mm -hmm. which was yeah. in the Heavenly Realms series and yeah. then in some other stuff that I was wanting to write. And I didn't have any way to visualize it. Okay. So what I, so I had a friend, I had my buddy, Chris knows longest running friend from high school. Shout out to Chris build me. He worked at a computer shop and uh, he built me a PC, a gaming PC. Mm -hmm. And I literally used that thing until it melted. And <laughs> so, <laughs> he melted it down. Yeah. And so he made this, uh, he made this PC. I ordered Rome total war and a graphics card and everything. And I played that and I was able to visualize and recreate as close as I could, you know, all of these battles that I had been writing about in, in the heavenly realm series, whether it was Empyrean falling, gray Aegis, um, Sturm and Drang, all of these different, you know, big engagements that I was trying to get onto the page. Um, it really made a big difference, but here's the thing. I say all that not just to not just to like talk about something but just to tell you also uh the reason why i know about rome total war is because it was used um in an in a tv show on the history channel called decisive battles which was narrated by uh a guy named um i can't remember the actor's name but he played uh captain spears in band of brothers like the crazy cool just like we're all going to die. So we're going to do some crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. Guy, like one of my favorite characters. In bit. Anyways, so great show. This is around 2005, 2006. The only reason I knew about this show was because uh, Stephen Pressfield was a talking head on that show. Mm, okay. And the only reason I found out about that is because I went to StephenPressfield.com. So all that to say, because I went to the website, I ultimately what that ended up with because I kept up with Steve and what all he was doing. I ended up with finding out about a computer game that really helped me, you know, as a resource mm -hmm. to actually write my novels. Cool. And so I'm telling you, you never know where that kind of stuff is going to come from, but like any writers you like, like keep up with them because you don't know what resources they're going to throw out there yeah. that might make or break your, your books. I mean, it's very arguable. And I got a whole other book, two books, actually two other novels out of the Rome total war game. I never would have known about it if I hadn't gone to Steve's press or his website yeah. and, you know, seen the, seen the TV show. Cool. So yeah, cool. So 
follow follow the people you like on social media, not just to support them, but also because you have no idea what their stuff is. It's going to lead to yeah. making or breaking your work. Yep. So anyways, yeah. whatever. Right. <laughs> I'll tell. I was going to tell Steve that story, but it'll wait until next time. I still had a question that I oh, did. You? Yeah, that I didn't have to. I didn't get to ask him. Really? Yeah. I was going to ask him how he celebrates finishing a, a draft. Oh, that's his right. First draft. Yeah. Or, or a successful launch. Whichever one he celebrates more. How does yeah. he do it? But he probably did celebrates by like we were talking about. He probably celebrates by just starting the next one. You know, <laughs> I wanted to ask him about uh, we didn't have time. It was it was the next one I had in the in the chamber. Uh, I wanted to ask him about sports because Steve and just like what other stuff outside of writing that Steve enjoys, uh, you know, obviously golf. But that kind of falls under, you know, writing still. Yeah. Um, Sports and what is it about sports? Because every time we talk to Steve, he's always, you know, Steve is really great about mentioning uh, some stuff about baseball or football. Mm -hmm. And there is a real life drama, you know, an epic nature that goes along with sports. And uh, I just it'd just be cool to hear what his thoughts are on it. Yeah, well, I think, you know, a lot of athletes take to their their training like it's an art form. Yeah. You know, with that level of ded dedication. Yeah. Uh, and uh, he's he's friends with a lot of athletes, if I'm not mistaken. I know I know they pay attention to what he has to say. Uh, but yeah. uh, but he looks, you know, he talks about. Yeah, he talks about like the Michael Jordans, the Kobe Bryant's and so forth. Uh, it's really cool to hear him talk about that. But yeah, it's yeah. probably golf. It's probably golf. And if you ever read The Legend of Bagger Vance, it'll be golf for you, too. Yeah, uh, because it's awesome. Was dad left handed? Uh, he no, he golfed right handed. OK, thank God. Yeah. I still have dad's golf clubs. There you go. And I have seriously been thinking about like Nick and I going to a golf course yeah. somewhere and just sort of. Yeah, because we both the irony is we both worked at a at a uh, we did. golf course. We did. We got to play for free. Now yeah. I'm like, I should have just stayed there. I know. It was so fun. Yeah, it was. Uh, that was my first job. Yeah. I was working at the golf course. Cool. Yeah, because of Nick. Because he was working there once. It was summer. a golf course that had golf carts. Yeah, you, it wasn't a course that you walked. Yeah. I don't think that you were allowed to walk. You had to. You had to get a cart, which is so, the yeah. only way to golf. Yeah, is in my opinion. I'm not walking. Yeah. I ain't walking. Forget that. I need to read. You... I'm gonna hit the ball, and you're gonna drive me to it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and we're gonna go yeah. four wheeling, most likely. <laughs> is it better to? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Is it better to uh, golf? First and then read the legend of Bagger Vance or read the legend of Bagger Vance and then golf. Go to the you need to golf. You need to play 18 holes at least. If yeah. you've never golfed, play 18 holes, then read the legend of Bagger Vance. Yeah. And then go back and play 18 holes again. And you probably will play more than just 18. You'll holes. get bitten by the bug. Oh yeah. 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 Awesome. As if I need another expensive habit. But I got dad's clubs. So yeah, that's like the big do, investment, man. right? Yeah, absolutely. He yeah. got the, he had nice clubs. Yeah jealous and, you, know, <laughs> you know you can use them you know uh, ain't yeah. nothing wrong with that yeah nick's only eight feet taller than me so, yeah right you know we'll have to well he'll be like dwarf he'll do it on knees <laughs> oh. dwarf talk about a blast how's that, from for, the past? How's that for a callback oh my god all right everyone uh you want to wrap you want to get out of here yeah let's let's do it yeah let's do it let's Absolutely. do it uh well, well real quick i guess uh shout out oh let's do well first of all patrons yes thank, thank you, you. Uh, for the pictures, uh, Mike, Shannon, and Jay Reese were all on this one. Thank you guys. Yeah. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, Roseanne, Adam, Ann, we thank you guys for also contributing. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Huge help. On the on the Patreon, which you guys should all sign up for, uh, by the way. Uh, on the Patreon, I, I did a one-off today. I typed a one-off just oh, as nice. my... Because I'm in between yeah. the books, oh, and I'm cool. still like developing the story I'm going to write, but I just finished the one. Yeah. And so I'm still trying to write in between. And so I did a one-off. Yeah. And uh, it's called You Don't Need a Dog. <laughs> <laughs> because I've been so upset with my dog lately. So I wrote a one and I uploaded it to, to the patrons. Yeah. To the patrons. Awesome. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. All future typewriter one-offs. If you go back and watch our old episodes, we used to do typewriter one-offs and they were a lot of fun. Yeah. But all future typewriter one-offs with perhaps maybe some unforeseen exception. Will only be on the Patreon. Yeah, yeah. On. I'm just gonna. We're just gonna send that to send yeah. that to patrons. And um, and and I wish they would too. Oh, that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. It'd be cool if the if you, if you patrons out there would if you ever write something 
essay, short story, long story. I don't care. Yeah. Maybe just daily pages, whatever. Mm-hmm. Uh, just upload something that you guys write. I'd yeah. Love, I'd love to read it. It'd be really cool to a build a, yeah, we do have a lot of writers and very talented people. It'd be really cool to sort of build a, you know, a forum community with them. I mean, yeah. you have Adam, you know, and his wife, D, uh, J. Reese Bradley just told me that uh, that Shannon is uh, quite the artist. And Shannon, I got news for you. She showed me some of your. Yeah, drawings. Uh, we're going to be talking. We're going to be reaching out to you. And I want to see more of your. Yeah, of your art. If Shannon, you're willing good. to share that sort of thing. Of course, yeah. I can. That's a sensitive thing for a lot of artists. Sometimes it they don't want to share. But yeah, it was awesome. Yeah. It was really awesome. It's impressive. I like to find those boundaries and just kitty cat tiptoe like over violate boundaries with the, my little kitty cat tail. Just. <laughs> You know, <laughs> but uh, yeah, if, if you're watching this, uh, we'd love for you to be a patron, patreon.com yeah. forward slash the goslings, five bucks a month. Yeah. Uh, and it'll help us hopefully make the show better. Yeah. I, well, <laughs> I tell you, it was rough with technology because yeah. there was such there was like delay in our audio getting to him. And yeah, um, I, I think we just need to figure out what it is and on our end. We're going to fix it, whatever it is, because uh, we yeah. had a little bit of an issue last time, too. We can't have a third time. No, uh, I know we can't. And, you know, we had it happen with John Bernardo. Um, although we got that one sorted out. And then we had it happen with Gary Wayne one time as well. When he was on with Derek. Uh, yeah. And so I don't know if it's an Internet uh, issue on our end or a restream issue on our end, or if it's just a weak Internet connection on our guests end occasionally uh, or, you know, a technical issue know. that we don't have any control over. I don't know what it is, but I know that. Two things and like this is where, you know, this is where like I have to ask people to join the the Patreon uh, because there are two expenses that I think will really help with this. One is upgrading our um, our restream, uh, yeah, our that's live streaming software, our live streaming software. If we can upgrade that, uh, then I think, you know, that at least increases our chances of not having it be a problem on their end. Um, and then two, eventually getting to a point where we have enough patrons to where we can pay for an engineer, someone can, to do all this. Yeah. While we're doing someone who can interview. troubleshoot that stuff. Yeah. That's the main thing I would, I would be willing to pay someone to come over and just, you know, be on deck. Yeah. Someone more techie and, yeah. you know, younger and, you yeah. know, you can, can be like, Hey, you guys are idiots. You should just let me do it. This is how you fix it. This is right. how you run it. You know? Yeah, because we need we need like we need like a Gen Z, mm -hmm. you know, kid who knows all about this stuff and what's next and for them to just do it. And we'll pay them. Yeah, that's what we want to get to. We because we want to focus on we want to focus on better questions, you know, with our great guests and uh, not have to worry about it. We we still want to do the chat. We don't want I don't want the producer show. We want to interact with everyone, but it's. You know, well, and poor Steve, I mean, you know, he was struggling too, and he actually sent uh, sent me an email about it. And yeah, poor guy, man, he was having, you know, reverb issues. And yeah. uh, and that really makes it hard to understand and concentrate when you're you're yeah. having, you know, double the fun of somebody's <laughs> voice in your head. <laughs> So, oh my gosh yeah so steve's uh, a real trooper is what i'm saying you know yeah. and and i don't think it was anybody's fault it's just technology sometimes yeah. you know craps the bed but um but yeah uh steve was a real trooper on this one and uh, i say we crap in technology's bed i would love to find it and Let's pull an it. amber turd <laughs> i would love to f- you know elon here's the thing like your cars like oh, whatever dude i don't care you know <laughs> mars i don't even really think mars is real okay <laughs> I, I don't. I don't think the moon landing was real, and I'm pretty sure maybe the Earth is flat. Okay, so here's the thing, Elon. Before you try and convince me, you know, of anything, why don't you just make a printer that works? And <laughs> For real, and just make an internet connection that doesn't suck. Yeah. How about you do those two things first, and then we'll proclaim you Tesla reborn, and and we will, you know laud you with praise whatever like i don't know you know yeah i will be your i will be in your mercenary army if you will just i will put my flesh and blood on the line to protect your assets isn't he making robots now probably you know well he's warning about ai but i'm just saying he's warning about ai but he's still making robots yeah well you know yeah 
playing both sides. Uh, he's playing both <laughs> sides. Is exactly what he's yeah. doing. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah, yeah. yeah. Gonna, uh, but just why don't we just make a printer that works? And just I make think an him that going to sense. Mars is a great idea. <laughs> You want him to be the first one on Mars? I want him to be. You know, he said he said himself he wants to die on Mars, just not on impact. Mm-hmm. You know. Fair. Yeah. Whatever. I'm like, well, well you know, beggars yeah. can't be choosers. He just, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, uh, I mean, no. Who's going to know the difference? Right. You know, uh, <laughs> and it's all the same. Oh, wait, we got uh, comments. Sorry. I, we got carried away. Hold on. Let me scroll down. Oh, my goodness. Uh, let's see. Thank you, children. Oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Shannon does children's illustration. That's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, what is this? The Donald Mallison one that you've spun on. Oh, yeah. Uh, Jay Reese is just commenting on uh, Shannon's drawings. So good. Yeah, we got a. Uh, well, we didn't even touch on that when we were talking to Shannon a few weeks ago. I know. We didn't know. Yeah, we See, didn't know. We didn't know. It's another now layer know. of the onion, Shannon. Yeah. And mm-hmm. we've said before we should get Jay Reese and Shannon like on one interview nick and i have been angling for that uh for a little while we're trying to find like a window of opportunity and uh, if you haven't you should go back and watch our interview with jay reese bradley and you should watch our interview Mm -hmm. with shannon Mm -hmm. um shannon has an amazing story that is incredibly edifying and uplifting Mm -hmm. uh and then jay is so much fun and she's got a cool story as well and jay is an author jay reese bradley the author of the rumble tide series yep uh and then shannon does illustrations and uh yeah we got to get the two of you and they're friends yep. so we got to get the two of you on at the same time because yep. i be cool. would be fascinated because your energy is so different like jay reese yeah, bradley yeah. is just you know she's super fun and just this bright sunshine you know and then like shannon is totally the moon she's so cool She's just like totally chill and just easygoing. Mm-hmm. And it's so much fun. It's so relaxing to talk to her. You know, there's like zero nervous energy at all in that interview. It's one of our best ones we've ever done. So I am fascinated to see what you two are like. That'd be interesting. At the same time. Yeah, it'd be really interesting. It'd be fun. <laughs> so yeah. anyways, yeah, we have a massive schedule. Uh, we are full uh, through January. Um, become a Patreon member and you will be able to find out uh, what our schedule is. Um, it really in perpetuity. Yeah, I just posted it the other day. Yeah. Updated schedule. Yeah. And you get discounts on uh, books and like merchandise because we got shirts through uh, Teespring and uh, all sorts of stuff, you know, and you just get to participate in a cool community and it helps support us so that we don't have these technical issues anymore. That's really what we're they will go for. away. We will figure yeah. it out. Yeah. yeah. We're going to crap in technology's bed. Yeah. I'm That's going to be our new thing. <laughs> And technology's bed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You should just have a picture of yeah, Amber slogan. You just have a picture of Amber Heard and little typewriters coming out of her butt. You know, <laughs> onto to a Tesla. Uh, <laughs> Anyways, all right. Yeah. Oh, with if you that, want Gosling's T-shirts. Oh yeah, T-shirts. Yes. Go to that ridiculous-looking link, uh, or be a patron, and mm-hmm. you get discounts. On t-shirts but yeah, yeah uh the goslings dot creator dash spring dot com because teespring does not do you any favors when it comes to this no they don't thank you teespring for yeah people have to remember what that looks like strike uh, down the darkness with the t-shirts yeah and uh you, we got up to great logos yeah you you got one that says put your ass where your heart wants to be stephen pressfield so cool yeah he he allowed he gave us permission to make that shirt by the yeah way. yeah that's what a sweet guy steve is we seriously yeah. we we made this we designed this just as a celebratory thing for steve to promote you know help him promote his new yeah, book which is awesome your heart wants to be. totally read and then uh and we were like listen it's over. like we're not trying to sell these t-shirts or anything we just did this for you for fun we thought it was cool. He was like, sell them, sell the hell out of them. He didn't care. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So that's what kind of guy Steve is. Very generous. We well, don't man. deserve him, but we'll take him. Oh, absolutely. I'm so <laughs> glad he decided to come back. And uh, we're going to, we need to iron out our tech wrinkles before we have him back on. Yeah. And we're going to make sure that's the case. We've got about three months. Yeah. So just, I think we can do it. Yeah. I think can we can done. do it. We can do it. Yeah. All right, guys. That's it for me. You good? Yeah. Yeah. I'm good. Yeah. All right. Well, You know the drill, guys. Go forth and strike down the darkness. We'll see you next week. I'm Jonathan. I'm Nick. And we are the Gosling.